So this guy, this guy is a guy named Bob McKim, and uh, he uh, was a creativity researcher in the 60s and 70s, and also led the uh, Stanford design program. And in fact, my friend and IDEO uh, founder, David Kelly, who's out there somewhere, uh, studied under him at, um, at Stanford. And uh, he liked to do an exercise with his students <clears throat> Uh, which, where he got them to take a piece of paper and draw the person sat next to them, their neighbor, um, very quickly, just as quickly as they could. And in fact, we're going to do that exercise right now. You all have a piece of cardboard and a piece of paper. It's actually got a bunch of circles on it. I need you to turn that piece of paper over. You should find it's blank on the other side. Okay. And uh, grab, there should be a pencil. And uh, I want you to pick somebody that sat next to you. And uh, when, I start, when I say go, You've got 30 seconds to draw your neighbor, okay? So, everybody ready? Okay? Off you go, you've got 30 seconds. You better be fast. Come on, those masterpieces. Okay, stop. All right, now. Yes. Lots of laughter. Yeah, exactly. Lots of laughter. Quite a, quite a bit of embarrassment. A few, uh, am I hearing a few sorries? I think I'm hearing a few sorries. Yeah, yeah, I think I probably am. No, and that's exactly, that's exactly what happens every time, every time you do this with adults. Every, um, and McKim found this every time he did it with his students, he got exactly the same response. Lots and lots of sorries. And, and, and he, he, would, he would point at this out as evidence um, that we fear the judgment of our peers and that we're embarrassed about kind of showing our ideas um, to, to people we think of as our peers, to those, to those around us. Um, and, and that it's that this fear is what causes us to be conservative in our thinking. So we might have a wild idea, but we're, not af we're afraid to share it with, with, with anybody else. Okay, so if you try the same exercise with kids, they have no embarrassment at all. They just quite happily show their masterpiece to whoever, whoever wants, to, um, wants to look at it. Um, but as they learn to become adults, uh, they, they become much more sensitive to the opinions of others, and they, they lose that freedom, and they, they do start to become embarrassed. Um, and in studies of, of kids playing, it's been, it's been shown time after time that kids who feel secure, that they're, who, who are in a kind of trusted environment, uh, they're the ones that feel most, free, uh, feel most free to play. And if you're starting a design firm, let's say, then you probably also want to create um, you know, a place where people have the same kind of security, where they have the same kind of security to take risks maybe have the same kind of security uh, to play. Before founding IDEO, David um, said that what he wanted to do was to form a company um, where all the employees are my best friends. Now, that wasn't just self-indulgence. Um, he knew that friendship is a shortcut, shortcut to play. And you know, it, he knew that it gives us a sense of trust and it allows us then to take the kind of creative risks that we need to take as a designer. And so that kind of decision to uh, work with his friends, now he has 550 of them, um, was, was, what got, um, was what got IDEO started. And our studios, like I, mean, I think many creative workplaces today, are designed to help people uh, feel relaxed. Um, familiar with their surroundings, uh, you know, comfortable uh, with the people that they're working with. I mean, it takes more than decor, but you know, I think we've all seen that you know, creative companies do often have think, symbols in the workplace uh, that remind us, um, remind people to be playful um, and that it's a permissive environment. So whether it's this microbus meeting room that we have in one of our buildings at IDEO, or at Pixar, where the, where the animators work in you know, wooden huts and decorated caves, or at the Googleplex, where you know, it's famous for its volley beach ball courts and even this massive dinosaur skeleton with pink flamingos on it. Don't know the reason for the pink flamingos, but anyway, they're there in the garden. Or 
even in the Swiss office of Google, which perhaps has the most wacky ideas of all. And my theory is that's so that the Swiss can prove to their Californian colleagues that they're not boring. So they have the slide and they even have a fireman's pole. Don't know what they do with that, but they have one. You know, so all of these places you know, have these symbols. Now, our big symbol um, at IDEO is actually not so much the place, it's a thing. And it's actually something that we invented a few years ago or created a few years ago, so it's a toy. And, uh, and it's called a finger blaster, and I forgot to bring one up with me. So if somebody can reach under that chair that's um, next to them then, you'll find something taped underneath it. That's great, and if you could pass it up. Thanks, David, I appreciate it. So this is a finger blaster, and um, you will find every one of you has got one taped under your chair. And I, and I'm gonna run a I wanna run a little experiment, <laughs> another little experiment, but before we start, I need just to put these on. Thank you. All right. Now, um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to see how many, I can't see out of these. Okay. I want to see how many of you at the back of the room can actually get these, these things onto the stage. So the, way, so the way they work is, you know, you just, um, you know, put your finger in the thing, pull them back, and off you go. So um, don't look backwards. That's my, only, that's my only recommendation here. So I want to see how many of you can get these things onto the stage. So come on. Here, there we go. Thank you. Thank you. Oh. I had another idea. I wanted to. Uh, there we go. There we go. <laughs> thank you, thank you, thank you. Not bad, not bad. No serious injuries so far. <laughs> oh, wow, they're still coming in from the back there. They're still coming in. Some of, the, some of you haven't fired them yet. Can you not figure out how to do it or something? It's not that hard. Most of, most of your kids figure out how to do this in the first 10 seconds when they pick it up. All right. This is pretty good. This is pretty good. OK. All right. Let's, uh, well, I suppose, I suppose we better I'm to clear these up out of the way. Otherwise, I'm going to trip over them. All right. So the rest, of you, the rest of you can save them for when I say something particularly boring, and then you can fire at me. OK. <clears throat> all right. I think I'm going to take these off now, because I can't see a damn thing when I've, uh, all right. OK, so, huh, that was fun. All right, good. So, OK, so, so, so why? So we have the finger blasters. Other people have dinosaurs. You know, wh why, why do we have them? Well, as I said, we have them because we think maybe playfulness uh, is, is important. But why is it important? Uh, we use it in a pretty pragmatic way, to be honest. Um, you know, we, we think playfulness helps us get to better creative solutions, helps us do our jobs better, uh, and helps us feel better when, when we do them. Now, um, an adult encountering a new situation, when we, when we encounter a new situation, we, we, we have a tendency to want to categorize it just as quickly as we can. You know, um, th and there's, you know, there's a reason for that. Uh, you know, we want to, uh, you know, we want to settle on an answer. Life's complicated. We want to, we want to figure out what's going on around us very quickly. I suspect actually that the evolutionary biologists probably have lots of reasons why we want to categorise new things um, very, very quickly. I mean, one of them might be, you know, when we see this funny stripy thing, um, is, it, is that a tiger just about to jump out and kill us, or is it just some weird shadows on the tree? We need to figure that out pretty fast. At least we did once. Most of us don't need to anymore, I suppose. This is some aluminum foil, right? You use it, you use it in the kitchen. That's, that's what it is, isn't it? Of course it is. Of course it is. Well, you know, not necessarily. <laughs> Kids are more engaged with open possibilities. Now, they'll certainly, when they come across something new, they'll certainly ask, what is it? Of course they will. But they'll also ask, what can I do with it? And, you know, the more creative of them might get to a really kind of interesting example. And this openness is the beginning of exploratory play. <clears throat> Any parents of young kids in the audience? Must be some. Yeah, thought so. So we've all seen it, haven't we? We've, um, we've all told stories about how on Christmas morning, you know, our kids end up playing with the boxes far more than they play with the toys that are inside them. And, uh, you know, from, a, from an exploration perspective, uh, this behavior makes complete sense because you can do a lot more with boxes than you can do with a toy. Even one like, say, Tickle Me, El uh, Tickle Me, Me Elmo, which despite its ingenuity, um, really only does one thing. Whereas boxes, you know, offer an infinite number of choices. So again, this is another one of those playful activities that as we get older, we tend to forget and that we have to relearn. 
Uh, so another one of Bob uh, McKim's favorite exercises is called the 30 circles test. So we're back to work. You guys are going to get back to work again. Um, you'll turn that piece of paper that you did the sketch on back over and you'll find those 30 circles printed on the, printed on the piece of paper. And so it should look like this. You should be looking at something like this. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you a minute and I want you to adapt as many of those circles as you can into objects of some form. So, example, you could turn one into a football um, or another one to, in, into a sun. All I'm interested in is quantity. I want you to do as many as them, of them as you can in the minute that I'm just about to give you. So, everybody ready? Okay. Off you go. Okay, put down your pencils, as they say. So who got more than five circles figured out? Hopefully everybody. More than 10, keep your hands up if you did. 10, 15, 20, anybody get all 30? No? Oh, somebody did, fantastic. Um, uh, did uh, anybody do a variation on a theme, like a smiley face, happy face, sad, you know, sad face, sleepy face? Anybody do that? Um, anybody use my examples? To, you know, use the sun and the football. Great, cool. Um, so I was really interested in quantity. I'm not, I wasn't actually very interested in whether they were all different. I just wanted you to fill in as many circles as possible. Um, and one of the things that we tend to do as adults, again, is we kind of, we edit things. We stop ourselves from doing things. We self-edit as we're having ideas. And some, in some cases, our desire to be original um, is actually that, you know, a, form of, a form of editing. Um, and, uh, and that actually isn't necessarily really, really playful. So that ability just to, just to kind of go for it and explore lots of things, even if they don't seem that different from each other, is actually something that kids do well, and, it's a, and it's, it is a form of play. So now, Bob McKim did another, very, another version of this um, test in a, in a rather famous experiment that was done in the, 19, in the 1960s. Anybody know what this is? It's the peyote cactus. It's the plant from which you create mescaline, one of the psychedelic drugs. For those of you who ran in the 60s, you probably know it well. McKim published a paper in 1966 describing an experiment that he and his colleagues conducted to test the effects of psychedelic drugs on creativity. Um, so he picked uh, 27 professionals. They were you know, engineers, physicists, mathematicians, architects, furniture designers even, artists. And he asked them to come along one evening um, and uh, bring a problem uh, with them that, that, uh, that, they, that, they, that they were working on. <clears throat> he gave each of them some mescaline and had them listen to some kind of nice, relaxing music for a while. Um, and then he did um, uh, what's called the Purdue Creativity Test. Actually, you might know it as how many uses can you find for a paperclip. It's basically the same thing as the 30 circles thing that I just had you do. Um, now, actually, he gave the test before the drugs and after the drugs to see how, um, ha what the difference was in people's sort of facility and speed with coming up, coming up with ideas. And then he asked them to go away and work on those problems that, 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 they'd, that, that they'd brought. And uh, they come up with a really bunch of kind of interesting solutions, actually quite kind of valid solutions to the things that they've been working on. And so some of the things that they figured out, some of these individuals figured out, so in one case, a new commercial building and design for houses that were accepted by clients, um, a, a design of a solar space probe experiment, um, a redesign of the linear electron accelerator, uh, an engineering improvement to a magnetic tape recorder, you can tell this is a while ago, um, a completion of a line of furniture, and even a new conceptual model of the photon. So it was a pretty successful evening. Um, in fact, maybe this experiment was the reason that Silicon Valley got off to its great start with innovation. I don't know, we don't know, but it may be. You need to ask some of those CEOs whether they're involved in this mescaline experiment. But really, it wasn't the drugs um, uh, that were important. It was this idea that what the drugs did were help shock people out of their normal way of thinking. Um, and uh, getting them to kind of forget the adult behaviors that were getting in the way of their ideas. And, but it's hard to break our habits, our adult habits. You know, at, at IDEO, we have our brainstorm, brainstorming rules written on the wall, edicts like defer judgment um, or go for quantity, and somehow that seems wrong. I mean, can you have rules about creativity? Well, it sort of turns out that we need rules to help us break the old rules and norms that otherwise we might bring, um, we might bring to the creative process. And, and we've certainly learned that over time, you get much better brainstorming, much more creative outcomes 
uh, when everybody does play by the rules. Now, of course, many designers, many individual designers, achieve this in a much more organic way. You know, I think the Eames, um, Eameses are wonderful examples of experiment, experimentation. And they experimented with plywood for many years without necessarily having one single goal in mind. Um, they were exploring, following um, what was interesting to them. And they went from designing splints for wounded soldiers coming out of World War II and, and the Korean War, I think. And from this experiment, they moved onto chairs and through constant experimentation with materials, developed a wide range of iconic solutions that we know today and eventually resulting in, of course, the legendary lounge chair. Now, if the Eames had stopped with that first great solution, then we wouldn't be the beneficiaries of so many you know, wonderful uh, designs today. Um, you know, and, they, and of course, they used experimentation in all aspects of their work, you know, from, uh, you know, from films to buildings, from ga um, games uh, to graphics. So they're great examples, I, I think, of, of, of exploration and experimentation in design. Now, while the, um, the Eames were exploring those possibilities, they were also exploring physical objects. And they were doing that through building prototypes. And building is the next of the behaviors that I thought I'd, um, that I thought I'd talk about. So the average um, you know, Western first grader spends as much as 50% of their playtime taking part in what's called construction play. Um, construction play is it's playful, obviously, um, but also a powerful way to learn. Um, when, you know, when, when play is about building a tower um, out of blocks, you know, the kid begins to learn a lot about towers. And as they repeatedly knock it down and start again, you know, learning is happening as a sort of byproduct of play. You know, it's classically learning by doing. <clears throat> Now, when David Kelly calls this behavior, when it's carried out by designers, thinking with your hands. Um, and it typically involves making multiple low-resolution prototypes very quickly, you know, often by bringing lots of found elements together in order to get to a solution. One of, the, one of his earliest projects, um, the, the team was kind of stuck. And uh, they came up with a mechanism by hacking together a prototype made from a roll-on deodorant. Now, that became the first commercial computer mouse for the Apple, Lisa, and the Macintosh. So they kind of learned their way um, by, to that by building, by building prototypes. Another example is as a group of, of, of designers were working on a surgical instrument with some surgeons. And they, they were meeting with them. They were talking to the surgeons about what it was they needed with this, with this device. And one of, the, one of the designers ran out of the room and grabbed a whiteboard marker and a film canister, which is now becoming a very precious prototyping medium, and a clothespin, taped them all together, ran back into the room and said, you mean something like this? And the surgeons could grab hold of it and said, well, I want to hold it like this or like that. And all of a sudden, a productive conversation was happening about design around a tangible, you know, a tangible object. And uh, in the end, it turned into you know, a, a, a real device. And so this behavior is all about quickly getting uh, something into the real world and having your thinking advanced as a result. <clears throat> At IDEO, there's a kind of a back to preschool feel sometimes about the environment. Uh, you know, the prototyping carts, you know, filled with colored paper and Play-Doh Play and glue sticks and stuff. I mean, they do have a, a bit of a kindergarten feel to them. But the kind of the big, the important idea is everything's to hand, everything's around. So when designers are working on ideas, they can start building stuff kind of whenever they want. They don't necessarily even have to go into some kind of formal workshop to do it. And we, we think that's pretty important. And then the sad thing is, although preschools are full of this kind of stuff, as kids go through the school system, it all gets taken away. They lose this kind of, this stuff that kind of facilitates this sort of, uh, this sort of playful and um, building mode of thinking. And of course, by the time we get to the average workplace, you know, the, the, uh, maybe the best construction tool we have might be the post-it note. It's pretty barren. You know, but by giving project teams um, and, and, you know, and their clients, whoever they're working with, permission to think with their hands, you know, quite complex ideas can, can go from, you know, go, spring into life and go right, through to, go, go right through to execution much more easily. This is a nurse using a very simple, as you can see, kind of plasticine prototype, explaining what she wants out of a portable information system to a team of technologists and designers that are working with her in a, in a, in a hospital. And just having this very simple prototype allows her to talk about what she wants in a much more powerful way. <clears throat> you know, and of course, by building quick prototypes, you know, we can get out and test our ideas with consumers and users much more quickly than if we're trying to describe them um, through, through words. But what about designing something that isn't physical? Something like a service or an experience? Something which exists as a series of interactions over time? Instead of, um, of building play, 
Uh, I mean, this can be approached um, with role play. So if you're designing an interaction between two people, such as, I don't know, ordering a food at a fast food joint or something, you need to be able to imagine how that experience might feel over a period of time. And I think the best way to achieve that um, and get a feeling for any flaws in your design is to act it out. Um, so we do quite a lot of work at, at IDEO trying to convince of our, our, our clients of this. They can be a little skeptical. I'll come back to that. Um, uh, you know, but a place, I think, where the effort is really worthwhile is where people are, are wrestling with quite serious problems. Um, things like you know, education or security or finance or health. And this is another example in a healthcare environment of some doctors and some nurses and designers acting out a service scenario around patient care. But you know, many adults are pretty reluctant to engage um, uh, with role play. Some of it's embarrassment, and some of it is because they just don't believe that what emerges is necessarily valid. Um, they dismiss an interesting interaction by saying, you know, that's just happening because they're acting it out. Research into kids' behavior actually suggests that it's worth taking role playing seriously. Because when children play a role, they actually follow social scripts quite closely that they've learned from us as adults. If one kid plays store and another one's playing house, then the whole kind of play falls down. And, and so they, they get quite used quite, uh, quite quickly to, 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 uh, to understanding the rules for social interactions and actually quite quick to point out when they're broken. So when, as adults, we role play, uh, then we have a huge set of these, inter of these scripts already internalized. We've gone through lots of experiences in life. Um, and they provide a strong intu in, um, intuition as to whether an inter interaction is going to work. Uh, so we're very good when acting out a solution uh, at spotting whether something lacks authenticity. So role play is actually, I think, quite valuable when it comes to thinking about experiences. Um, another way for us as designers to explore role play is to put ourselves um, through an experience which we're designing for and kind of project ourselves into an experience. So here are some designers who are trying to understand what it might feel like to sleep in a kind of confined space on an aeroplane. And so they grabbed some very simple materials, you can see, and did this kind of role play, this kind of very crude role play, just to get a sense of what it would be like for passengers if they were kind of stuck in quite, quite small places on, on, on airplanes. This is one of our designers, Christian Simsarian, and he's putting himself through the experience of being an ER patient. Now, this is in a real hospital, in a real emergency room. One of the reasons he chose to take this rather large video camera with him, because he didn't want the doctors and nurses thinking he wasn't, that he was actually sick and sticking something into him that he was going to regret later. So anyhow, he, he, went, he went there with this, with this video camera, and, um, and, and, and it was kind of interesting to see what he brought back, because when we, when we looked, at the, looked at the video when he got back, um, we saw 20 minutes of this. And that was the amazing thing about this, about, this, uh, about this video. As soon as you see it, you, you can kind of immediately project yourself into that experience and, and, and know what it feels like, all of that uncertainty while you're left out in the hallway while the docs are dealing with some more urgent case you know, in one of the emergency rooms, wondering what the heck's going on. And so this notion of using kind of role play, in this, or in this case, kind of living through the experience as a way of creating empathy, particularly when you use video, is really powerful. Or another one of our designers, Olte Sendel, he's here having his chest waxed, not because he's very vain, although actually he is. Um, no, I'm kidding. Um, but in order to empathize with the pain that chronic care patients go through when they're having dressings removed. And so sometimes these kind of analogous experiences, kind of analogous role play, can also be quite valuable. You know, so when a kid dresses up as a firefighter, you know, he's beginning to try on that identity. He wants to know what it uh, feels like to be a firefighter. We're doing the same thing as designers. We're trying on these experiences. And so the idea of role play is, is both as an empathy tool um, as, uh, as well as a tool for prototyping experiences. And you know, we kind of admire um, people who do this, um, at IDEO anyway, not just because they lead to insights about the experience, but also because of their willingness to explore and their, build, uh, their ability to kind of unselfconsciously surrender themselves uh, to the experience. In short, we admire their willingness to play. So playful exploration, <clears throat> playful building, and role play. And those are some of the ways that designers um, use play in their work. And, you know, and, and so far, I kind of admit that this, this might feel like it's a message just to go out and play like a kid. And in a cert, to a certain extent, it is. <clears throat> but I want to stress a couple of points. First thing to remember is that <clears throat> play is not anarchy. Uh, the play has rules, especially when it's group play. 
And when kids play tea party or they play cops and robbers, they're following a script that they've agreed to. Um, and it's this co-negotiation uh, that leads to productive play. So remember the sketching task we did at the beginning, the kind of little face, the portrait you did? Well, imagine you know, if you did the same task with friends but w while you were drinking in a pub. And, um, but everybody agreed uh, to play a game where the worst sketch artist bought the next round of, get, bought the next round of drinks. That framework of rules would have turned you know, an embarrassing, difficult situation into a kind of a fun game. And as a result, you know, we all feel more, we'd all feel perfectly secure and, and, and have a good time. Um, but, we, we, but because we all understood the rules and we agreed on them together. <clears throat> but there aren't just um, rules about how to play, there are rules about when to play. Kids don't play all the time, obviously. Um, they transition in and out of it. And teachers, you know, good teachers, spend a lot of time thinking about uh, how to move kids through these experiences. And as designers, we need to be able to transition in and out of play also. Um, and if we're you know, running design studios, we need to be able to figure out how can we transition designers through, um, through these different experiences. I think this is particularly true if we think about this sort of, what I think what's very different about design <clears throat> is that we go through these two very distinctive modes of operation. We, 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 and we go through um, um, a sort of a generative mode where we're exploring many ideas, and then we kind of come back together again and have, on, 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 kind of come back looking for that sort of solution and developing that solution. I think, I think they're two quite different modes, uh, sort of divergence and convergence. And I think uh, it's probably in the divergent mode that we, mo we most need the playfulness. Perhaps in convergent modes, we need to be more serious. And so being able to move between those modes is really, really quite important. So it's where a kind of a more nuanced version of, of view of play I think is required. Because it's very easy to fall into the trap that these states are absolute. You're either playful or you're serious, and you can't be both. Um, but you know, that's not really true. You can be a serious professional adult and at times be playful. Um, it's not an either or, it's an and. You can be serious and play. So to kind of uh, sum it up, um, we need trust to play, and we need trust to be creative, so there's a connection. And there are a series of behaviors that we've learned as kids and that turn out to be quite useful to us as designers. They include exploration, which is about going for quantity, building and thinking with your hands, and role play, where acting it out helps us both have more empathy for the situations in which we're designing and to create services and experiences that are seamless and authentic. Thank you very much.